There we go. Good morning, Shannon. How are you feeling today? Hey, good morning, Andrew. I'm feeling feeling well, ready to go. Good. Well, I know Christine and I have had uh, a couple cups of coffee to get our day started, so we are we are uh, conveniently caffeinated here, and appreciate you taking some time to sit down and talk to us a little bit. Um, you're somebody that we, me personally, and, and most of us in the ag tech community have admired for many years, and, and I've had the pleasure of going to a lot of your events, and not only seeing you speak on stage, but also seeing the events that you facilitate and coordinated. And um, the, the one thing that always struck me about you personally is that rarely do you ever take credit for anything. There's, you know, if there's ever a prize or a, an acrylic plaque to be given out, you're, you're, you're quick to point to someone behind you saying, you know, this would not have happened without that person behind you. And, and Christina and I felt it was time to put you on stage and, and maybe hear from you yourself and let you talk a little about what, what, what it is that you've done and, and what have you. And, and Christina, I've mentioned your name a couple of times. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and then, then we'll, um, we'll have Shannon introduce himself as well. Sure. Thanks so much, Andrew. I'm really uh, honored to be here today with you and Shannon. So my name is Christina Connolly. I am with the Consulate General of Canada in Minneapolis, where I handle our food and agricultural trade and investment files. And I guess I've known Shannon for quite a few years now. I was previously with the state of Minnesota when he joined AURI. And so I've, I've watched much of his good work grow here in Minnesota and excited for this conversation. So thank you. Well, that's wonderful. And, and then Shannon, um, you know, I've read your CV, I've read your biography, and I'm sure there's a lot of things in there that you would like to highlight. I could certainly sit, sit here for 10 minutes and read the whole thing myself, but why don't you talk about your, your background? You know, where did you go to school? How did you, how did you get into agriculture? And, and then what is, what was the personal mission that drove you here to Ori? Got it. Perfect. Well, thank you both Christina and Andrew for, for having me today. And uh, it's great to have an opportunity to highlight um, things that AURI is doing and, and the work and kind of the direction that we see things moving uh, as an organization as well. So I'll step back. My name is Shannon Schlecht, as, as was said, and I'm the executive director at the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. We'll just say AURI or ORI going forward because it's uh, just uh, it's a pretty big mouthful uh, on that end. So uh, I'll just uh, step back to right early years. I'm a farm kid from Southeast North Dakota. Uh, overall. So my agricultural roots go, go way back, uh, right, to the single digits of, of growing up on the farm and uh, helping out and doing, right, everything that you could uh, as a, right, I, another brother and then my dad that we operated uh, like a thousand acres, small grain and cattle farm uh, during that time period. Uh, so uh, I think I was out working and driving combine before I had a driver's license and, right, doing all those great things that, that farm kids do uh, to, uh, to get their hands dirty and, and get some great experiences. So I actually um, uh, graduated then and went to North Dakota State University, which was about an hour away from where I, I grew up. Uh, and uh, interesting story, I actually started out as a piano performance major uh, at, at college. So um, very few people know that, that I, I like to play the ivory and um, right, have that experience. Uh, but as luck would have it, I was um, back helping out with the harvest my first week of college and I had a farm accident, right? And uh, injured my, my um, left hand. Uh, actually when I was doing that. So I switched majors uh, the next semester uh, over to agricultural economics and right back to the roots of what I what I was doing. Uh, still ended up doing a minor uh, in piano performance, which was was great. And I taught uh, like 20 kids piano lessons during my time at college. Uh, so just had a great right experience and how music is still um, a big part of, of who I am and, and what I do as well. And all right, that cre creativity side is I think help, helpful uh, as we look at ARI and, and what we do as, as well. Um, I then have the experience to go to uh, Washington DC for a couple of summers during college, uh, which was, was again, great fun. Went up on the hill to understand the legislative process and just write the big picture elements that were going on uh, and one at the National 4-H Center. Uh, and I had uh, I have been active in 4-H for, for many years and 4-H I think really uh, set a lot of great um, values and just a lot of great experiences uh, for me as I was grow growing up in terms of public speaking, uh, right, connecting with people and, and just having that greater, greater appreciation. Uh, upon graduating with my IGECON degree, I um, took a six-month exchange program to Germany uh, through the IFI program um, for a great international experience, opening my eyes right around uh, just how big the agricultural world is and how uh, right farms function and perform at, at right in different countries and just how policies shape uh, right a lot of what what happens there and just economics and, and all those different aspects so I got to live with seven different families uh, and uh, experience right agriculture in a much different way 
than what I had done growing, growing up. Uh, again, I think a really eye-opening experience, uh, thought that I had a lot more to learn uh, coming back from that experience and ended up going to graduate school. Uh, again, at North Dakota State University. Well, Shannon, and, let, me, uh, let me ask you this. I, I yeah. guess that, that certainly sounds like immersion right there. I assume you picked up German or do you still? You can speak my bisschen Deutsch, yeah. <laughs> so if you know my name, my Schlecht is a very, very German name. So uh, I often had to introduce myself as Nick Schlecht, uh, which means Schlecht means bad uh, in German for those that uh, that don't speak it. Uh, so Nick is, is not. So I was would, would say I'm Shannon, not bad, right, with my uh, German host families to try to get a chuckle and a, and a laugh because right laughter does drive a lot of uh, relationships and just getting people people connected. Um, so it was yeah, that was a, an amazing experience uh, for me uh, in terms of just opening my eyes. And then graduate school was just a, a natural progression following that. Uh, and I ended up uh, getting a, a master's degree in logistics uh, right with a, with an economics um, uh, right under that program. Uh, very timely with what was going on uh, in agriculture. Uh, I focused on supply chains with biotechnology. Uh, it was late 1980s, right? Biotech crops had just been introduced uh, and did a lot of work on um, parallel supply chains. How do you keep um, testing, um, quality assurance, segregation issues, and all of that, and looking at the economics and challenges uh, right through my, my thesis. Uh, so it was uh, just a, a again very practical uh, in terms of what we were were doing uh, at Good that question. time. I mean, back then, was traceability as big an issue back then as it is now? Uh, it was emerging, uh, right? I would say more so, and um, uh, like just a lot on what were the GMO tolerances going to be, right? What are going to be the costs of the supply chain? Uh, how accurate is the testing in terms of rejected loads? As you start looking at demerge and dispatch and Right, all the different things that happen throughout the supply chain um, is where I spent spent a lot of time. And then just looking at right um, cost of storage and segregation and needs and right what does that all start to look like. And I focused on the wheat market um, during my thesis. And as we know, wheat has a lot of different quality segregations, a lot of different classes of wheat. Um, right, it gets pretty complex uh, pretty quickly uh, as you look at that specific spe specific commodity. Um, so there was a lot of interest in looking at the costs and right what are some systems that could be put in place or recommendations. Uh, of um, uh, of that area, right at that time. And you know, yeah. When I was reading your bio, I saw the wheat in the background, and I think about the situation over in Eastern Europe right now, and how critical wheat is right now for the next two years. It's going to be top, one of the top agricultural conversation starters, at least. You know, and and I mean, any perspective that you can offer. I mean, is is there hope, or are we kind of in that gray area, or are things looking gloomy from your perspective? Yeah, it's a great, a great question, right? And I wish, if wish I had the answers, uh, right, to a lot of those questions, Andrew. It's, um, I mean, a, 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 I mean, wheat is so important to, I mean, so many countries in terms of, um, right, a, a staple food supply, and right, even as you think about um, protein, and we, I know we talk a lot about protein, right, during our conversations, and uh, I was, you know, I at one time I heard a statistic that wheat provides twenty percent of the protein to diets around the the world. All right, when you think about how how much protein there is in that cereal grain. Right, and how widely it is consumed um, when you look at per capita consumptions, and especially in a lot of uh, Middle Eastern and, and um, right, um, mainly Middle Eastern countries, uh, right, in terms of just that staple staple diet element that it is. So, uh, uh, yeah, getting getting ahead, I actually spent um, five year or four years uh, living in that that part of the world. I was based in Cairo, Egypt, for for several years, uh, and uh, working on market development across East Africa, the Middle East, uh, North Africa. Uh, right, and just uh, working with um, uh, industry around, right, uh, what do they need to be looking at from a technical assistance standpoint in terms of processing, uh, risk management overall in their procurement, um, helping with contract specifications of purchasing wheat from the United States, right, and you just see uh, very clearly how important wheat, wheat is to a lot of those countries and, right, how supply chains have shifted from my time there to, right, um, uh, to the reliance on Ukraine and, and Russia and those local supplies and just shortening those supply chains and right just the, the, the prices as well when you look at um, sending 5,000 ton coasters from the Black Sea versus right handy max or Panamax size vessels from from the United States right from an economies of, of scale standpoint uh, right they've just uh, that has really shifted pretty dramatically um, towards those origins so I mean I, I feel for Africa um, for the Middle East in terms of right just securing those supplies is is critical and all right, we need solutions to make sure that those um, populations are right meeting their food security needs, uh, right? So we don't have uh, uh, further unrest uh, around the world. Yeah, um, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, continue on a, a, a little bit how I got into wheat, 
um, right from a, a background uh, standpoint. So I, um, yeah, finishing my master's degree, I, I was uh, looking at several different different jobs. One was trading, uh, one was into IT um, consulting, and the other was uh, market development for wheat, uh, right? And uh, uh, we ended up moving to Portland, Oregon, uh, and spent about five years living living in, in Portland. It, which is, it was such a great experience and such a unique town and very different from my, right, North Dakota growing up. And I think of the experiences on the, right in Europe and in the, the East Coast. Uh, and we just had a great time um, experiencing the West Coast and, right, the different, um, uh, just the different approaches. And I don't think a lot of people realize how important Portland is to our wheat export um, our community. Uh, roughly 40% of all wheat exports from the United States go out of the, the Columbia River. Uh, and uh, it is right the Asian markets uh, um, and the South American markets, right, and even across to uh, Yemen and Egypt as well with the soft white wheat that's growing in the Pacific Northwest. So um, such a, a critical export point and the rail comes together, the barge is there, uh, right, it's just a, a unique confluence. Uh, and the role that I had in, in Portland was such a great first industry experience for me um, because I was working for a producer organization doing international market development. Uh, I was interacting daily with the exporters, uh, right, and the merchandising and all the challenges that they face in terms of, right, moving um, um, grain from the interior to great foreign countries. Uh, we were working with wheat, the wheat quality lab that was out there in terms of um, functional quality and, right, how important quality is, especially as we were moving towards automation and just efficiencies in, in milling quality. Uh, and then I got to work with uh, wheat breeders there as well to, right, just send that information back down through the, uh, through the value chain. Uh, right to think about uh, breeding targets and uh, what what our buyers are, were really looking for, uh, and um, right and then the federal grain inspection service was right there to understand quality insurance and contract specs and how like one word can mean things so differently in terms of the interpretation of how they're going to inspect the grain, uh, right and what that means from a, a quality assurance standpoint to our, our customers around the world. So right just immersed from from the really early stages of breeding through the production side. Right through the the supply chain of working with barge operators, the rail, right, and uh, and then into the export community, and then right from that point, uh, it was connecting them with our flour millers, our bakers, our government buyers, our private buyers, right, in countries around the world, uh, and it was my first exposure to to travel to Asia uh, routinely and meet with um, right our customers there and just uh, help reinforce why U.S. wheat was a good value to them uh, and um, right what uh, they needed to do to make sure they were they wanted the we're getting the quality that they were looking for. Well, Shannon, I'm, I'm surprised you're still not in the wheat sector. There, there must have been something special about Ori to, to shake you loose from that. I mean, yeah, there's yeah, there's, there's certainly, there certainly was. It's a, a great point. So I actually, um, right, when we uh, did, did um, uh, U.S. Wheat Associates, right, we moved to Portland and then we moved to, to Cairo, Egypt. Um, and then we were there for four years and I should back up. And then I spent five years in D.C., uh, right, working on trade policy and biotechnology uh, issues. So it was a great, again, just uh, experience. But my, um, um, after about 14 years with wheat, my wife had a great, great opportunity uh, with, a, with a founder to, to do an entrepreneurial venture. Uh, and uh, with that, I was a, a trailing spouse uh, to Minnesota uh, for her to advance her, her uh, right career and opportunities that she had put on hold while we, we moved around the world for, for me. Uh, and uh, that got me to, to Minnesota uh, and just started doing some networking and talking to a lot of, a lot of people and came across AURI. Uh, and um, I uh, had never heard of the organization before, in all honesty, it was uh, um, something that, that was uh, a very local, right, in terms of its, uh, um, I think, awareness and, and brand. Uh, and um, I right, interviewed, I met some of the people, I'm like, this, this organization has a lot of potential, uh, and uh, right, decided to, to go through the process, and uh, they hired me uh, the same day that I interviewed, actually, which was, was pretty, uh, pretty interesting in terms of just moving really quickly. Uh, and then uh, it's been seven years, uh, Andrew, which is amazing how quickly quickly the time flies uh, on, um, on right when you're having fun at an organization and one that covers so much territory every day is different. And uh, it's been a, been a great journey. And I think I met you not too long after you started. I'm looking back at the timeline there, but Ori's been around for 30 years and you've been there for seven, correct? Correct. Yeah, we've so just. There, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say there are probably some things that were done prior to you getting there that that you've kept going forward. Some things that that really struck you um, that way. What are, what are some of the things that their legacy ORI, um, either initiatives or mission based um, projects that they're working on that you have adopted and move forward? 
Yeah, great, great question. So there are there are many great things that that were going on at the the organization and and you know and still are uh, in terms of how we're driving driving impact and looking at at opportunities. I mean, overall, our program framework hasn't changed um, as an organization. I think it was really well set up in terms of how we approach um, gaps and in innovation, uh, and um, right trying to move uh, commercialization opportunities forward. Uh, so we, uh, our main main programs, um, we've we've changed a couple, but our ma two main core programs, commercialization services uh, and initiatives, really haven't changed um, right over that time period. Um, so commercialization services is really uh, looking at right what can we do with private business around um, gaps that they have in R and D needs, uh, technical and business assistance to help them move a product forward from either proof of concept or right product or process improvements. Uh, to get that into the commercial marketplace and just to accelerate that that um, journey as as much as we can with the resources that we have as an organization you know that's probably 40 percent of what we do uh, as an, an organization um, the other is is initiatives uh, and that's where we take a look at conversations with all of our stakeholders that we do every couple of years uh, and look at commonalities and gaps uh, that we see from you know having conversations with probably 70 plus organizations around minnesota and the region uh, to see what a, you know what are areas that we could help um, fill those information gaps and create public initiatives around to create right awareness education uh, help de-risk a concept to to then move it forward to a commercial um, venture uh, potentially as we moved on that program framework a um, couple of things that we have changed uh, or added to one would be our ARI connects program uh, which is um, doing a lot more not, uh, I'd say outreach and events than we've ever done in the past. Uh, and I know Andrew, we've uh, right met at several of those, and um, right we've launched more virtual elements as well. Obviously, with everything that happened in, in 2020, uh, and then we just recently launched uh, an entrepreneur in residence program, which we had kind of been been right working on or, or piloting to a degree, and that's looking at how do we um, best utilize our resources and infrastructure that we have. Uh, we have two laboratories in rural Minnesota, uh, and we have right specialized equipment and things that, that entrepreneurs and early stage companies don't have access to, right? Or that it's, it's a diversion of cash, right? From one thing to another. And if we can help them um, put their resources to the best use and utilize some of our resources um, through a, a residency program, uh, that is one that we are pretty excited about in terms of having impact and uh, it being a leveraging opportunity for federal grants and ways that they can, right? Utilize the unique resources that we have here uh, as well to, to further their opportunities. That's Really interesting. I didn't know about that one, but I was going to say I've definitely noticed like the uptick in events while we've been sitting here. We got an email about your brewing in Minnesota webinar coming up and there's always stuff like that coming through on so many different topics of interest regionally. So it's, it's really been fun to watch. What what would you say you most enjoy about your role at AURI? Yeah, I would say what's what's most interesting for me is right well, just the innovative ideas that we see daily, um, right? I, I'm always amazed at just the creativity that we see from producers to small businesses to, to entrepreneurs. Uh, and they have got some, some, you know, sometimes some wild ideas, right? That are out there like, whoa, this is, you know, probably a little outside of our mission and, and how do we, we do this? And then others that are, right? Just really thinking um, intently around, right? We've been thinking about this, you know, what do you think? How do we move this forward? Are there some, is there some opportunity space? And, just helping them think through and formulate that that journey um, in a way that maybe right they haven't considered before, and, and just based on that breadth of exposure that we have on a daily basis, uh, how we can we can just right help avoid some pitfalls uh, and uh, help them right figure out how how do we move this how do we move this forward in, in a way that minimizes resources from there and gives it the most uh, most potential. Uh, and I, I would say too, I think what's really unique about ARI is where we sit um, from a, a nexus standpoint. Uh, I mean, daily I'm visiting with producers, right? But I'm also visiting with entrepreneurs, um, medium-sized businesses that we're working with, cooperatives, right? And then um, regular conversations with the Fortune 500s, uh, right? So it's just, uh, you get to see where all those different value chain or industry segments are at in terms of their thinking and then, right, try to connect the dots um, for a, a lack of a better way of, of you know, where, where can we be most impactful or what should we really be looking at to drive needs uh, as we're hearing them and solutions, right, that we're hearing as well uh, and, and connecting the dots. Um, and the other, I'd say, area that ARI is really unique at is, I think we mentioned 30 plus years of existence. Uh, we've got a lot of networks in, in the industry and in business. So when we hear of something, 
we can really quickly um, create a, a connection point or a referral uh, around a gap or um, right, a need uh, that we've heard of or seen and, and just start connecting those dots much more quickly all right, then, um, uh, then what right, somebody doing it on their own would be able to do, where it might take them six months to a year to find the right um, company that also has a, an interest in right, just accelerating that timeline of, uh, of moving that forward and getting the right connections made. So yeah, I think that's, that's uh, really a lot of the, the uniqueness and um, the fun uh, right, as well in terms of, uh, of what we're able to do. Yeah, it's a really unique model. I mean, and that's a good segue for the, the next question that I had, because I spend a lot of time trying to describe you guys because I work with businesses as well who are not from Minnesota. And so they don't know about you. And I, I think not a lot of places have something like an AURI. So can you talk a little bit about how AURI is organized and maybe even funded and maybe the evolution of it? Because it's sort of quasi-governmental, right? Or at least its history was. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. I, I honestly have not come across another organization like ARI either uh, in my, my time in industry. There's, there's some similar right entities, but nothing that's quite, quite like how we're structured and organized as, a, um, as an organization. So our, our origins go back to the 1980s farm crisis, uh, where we had low prices, high supplies, uh, and just looking at how, you know, what are ways that, that we can creatively look at disappearance uh, right and helping um, move some demand opportunities forward. So, so we were organized originally as part of the Greater Minnesota Corporation, uh, right, which was a, a government right um, effort to uh, drive. I think it was manufacturing, forestry, and agriculture were the three three areas. Uh, quickly um, spun out as a as a five hundred one c three nonprofit, uh, right from from that effort. So we are a, a nonprofit corporation, um, but I would say a, right a quasi governmental or public charity uh, with how how we're, we're structured. Uh, from that. So uh, the state legislature has been an amazing partner um, for us as an organization, right, funding for 30 plus years to uh, really look at how can we um, drive uh, new products, new market opportunities, uh, working directly with entrepreneurs and businesses, provide uh, technical and financial assistance, uh, and really develop markets for agricultural products. Uh, and uh, that relationship has just been, been phenomenal, um, right, as I think about, about just uh, that support that they've had uh, right, and helping us really be flexible in many ways around driving impact and looking at opportunity areas. So we do have legislators that sit on our board of directors as well to provide, provide oversight. Uh, and then we've also got producers and agribusiness and, and some at-large members as well. Uh, but the, so we were founded in, 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 that, in that manner. Uh, and then we have um, uh, a directive to really, again, just right, drive the most impact for, for Minnesota and the region in terms of uh, supporting the agricultural industry, leveraging opportunities, uh, creating those those relationships and connections uh, between different segments of the value chain. Uh, I think what's also um, unique is we are we are a post harvest uh, type organization, right? Um, so we do not do production agriculture um, as a as an entity. We right get connected into production agriculture with some of the the value add things that we do, uh, but that is not our, our focus, right? So I think of everything post harvest or value added processing as really our you know our space. Uh, as an, an organization, and right, I, that may feel limiting to some, but man, that's a big space, right, in terms of what's going on in agriculture today, uh, and just the uh, the breadth of opportunity that exists as we look at post harvest opportunities and value added processing. Um, so we then do um, uh, right a lot of grant work uh, as well, where we we partner uh, or apply for grants with our research and promotion councils. Uh, we do fee for service work with companies as well, um, licensing agreements and arrangements with technologies that we've created uh, as an organization, uh, and then um, right, just uh, we do, uh, some donations um, as well that come in since we are five one c three on on that end. But I'd say uh, federal grants, right, fee for service and project work, and of course our our base funding from the state uh, is really what what um, supports our organization and, and helps move us forward. Shannon, you, you probably answered this in, in a multitude of different ways and in, in all the other uh, responses that you had there, but this is clearly your organization. I mean, you are there now. Um, Ori's got a great board of directors. They have a great vision. So do you. Um, what are some of your North Stars? Where do you really see Ori moving towards in the sort of the midterm and the long-term future? Yeah, great, great question. So we um, right talk about that quite a bit in terms of um, right how do we how do we really create the most impact right and what are ways that we can do so as an, an organization, um, and I think you we've hit on a, a lot of this um, already. I mean, really, I what drives I'd say a lot of um, just uh, enthusiasm around our our staff and I think our directors is right that those tangible elements of right like we had a we had part in that. 
product that's on the that, that's in the marketplace today, right? So how do we continue to to drive those economic development opportunities, uh, right? Of seeing seeing disappearance of commodities or egg products uh, here. Uh, and, uh, and getting those to the marketplace that we know consumers are looking for alternatives and options and right um, shortening supply chains is a, a big element as well as we look at right how do we create some some additional activities and, and manage some risk uh, on uh, ingredients or right um, elements that could go into you know bio based products or whatever that might might be um, so I think that's that's one clear area that we're going to continue right moving moving down as an, an organization and, and how we do that. Uh, the, the other is, and we talk a lot about what are some, some bigger risk areas that we should be taking on, uh, right? And you think of ethanol um, overall and just uh, how much of a game changer that was and, you know, where that started from, a, a, um, from an idea standpoint, right? And are there some, some big ideas out there that we should be starting to de-risk uh, and, and take on? And I think that is something we're going to spend more time on as an organization, of um, right, really uh, doubling down or thinking about what are what are a couple areas, and I'm excited about that, uh, right? Personally, to see right how do we how do we get that early stage element of of a, an ideation to right commercial commercialization impact? You, know, you think a little bit about the the hydrogen economy and what's going on and and that the opportunities for agriculture there. Um, you know, I think about what's what's happening from just this food and health space, and I know Christina and I have talked a lot about um, that in the past. Uh, and and how Minnesota is so uniquely positioned, I think as well. Not that other places aren't, right? But we have right all these great egg companies uh, here. Uh, we've got a, a, a land grant college with a medical school. Uh, we've got the Mayo Clinic uh, as well. Uh, in terms of uh, on the health side, we've got Med uh, Medical Alley, which does a lot on the med tech side, uh, right? And we've got this great ecosystem of food and agriculture. Uh, and uh, how do we better unite all of those? And, and right, you think of some of the conversations that are happening. I mean, uh, later this month, right, on at the um, on food security and, and nutrition, and I just hear a lot about nu nutrient density, uh, right? And right, are there some further things that we could be, be doing in that in that space? And you know, we just wrapped up a, a study on digestibility issues on wheat, and really, really interesting, uh, right? In terms of the um, uh, the Department of Agriculture funded funded it. Uh, and uh, we looked at wheat varieties going back 100 years with the University of Minnesota, right, to see, right, why are all these irritable, irritable bowel syndrome or digestibility issues occurring, uh, right, and is there something we've un, un, unintentionally done uh, in our breeding program, we strive for yield and disease resistance and, right, all these other, other pieces, and so it was like, the, it was the first time that I think I've seen, uh, right, a comprehensive look at germplasm going back that, that far to see, you know, what's changed or has anything changed, uh, on this end, uh, we didn't find any strong correlations or causality, uh, right? Or there are no trend lines that something has happened. So what else is going on? And you start thinking about, um, um, I mean, processing has changed a, a lot uh, over the last probably 20, 30 years in terms of um, less fermentation or less, uh, right, sourdough type products in terms of that bacteria breaking down harder to digest starches, uh, right? And are there just, are there more like little areas like that where we could be impactful on weeds, the third largest, you know, crop that's grown in, in Minnesota from an acreage standpoint? Uh, and how do we help um, develop maybe some niche opportunities, right? We look at at that market is probably, I mean, estimated at 20% of wheat, wheat consumers are, right, purchase gluten-free or, or, right, or look at alternatives there. And I mean, that's a pretty, pretty big opportunity area when you start to think about it from a, a dollar standpoint and uh, creating some new product space. So, right, those are our areas. And then I'm, I'm also excited about the hydrogen economy and just uh, thinking about, um, right, carbon intensity. And as we look at all these goals around sustainable aviation fuel and, um, right, RINs and how you get, get you know, better scores. Uh, and then, right, are there some local opportunities around hydrogen that we, we can really think forward about? And one, one that we keep coming back to and the U of M has done some great work on this is um, greener fertilizers. Because uh, we do have a lot of carbon dioxide production here with our ethanol facilities, uh, right? And we can do, we've got wind and solar um, to do the, uh, the hydrogen piece, uh, right, as well. And then, right, those two pieces come together and with uh, turning hydrogen into green ammonia, um, you've got a perfect combination to create local urea. Uh, and I think Minnesota imports 95 to 100% of its fertilizer. Uh, right. So um, you look at, right, is there a great value add opportunity in a circular approach uh, as we start thinking about different different supply chains? So, right, some really fun things on the horizon that we're really trying to think forward around and um, and then thinking about ethanol into fuel cells, right, and kind of the work that Nissan and Toyota and uh, there's some Canadian companies looking at that as well. And, um, right, what is that next uh, step in terms of 
even um, you know less in transportation, but even industrial needs, and when they have right, they can't get enough peak power uh, during times, or right, just um, right. Are there some other ways that we can think creatively around that that utilize agricultural feedstocks into it? So I probably went on longer than I should have there, but uh, right, no, just, it's, uh, just it's a great. lot of fun things on the horizon that we're we're taking a, taking a look at, um, uh, and how right some of those bigger ideas could be you know transformational in terms of uh, local um, economic development and. I think on trend uh, with what we see around sustainability desires from consumers and right commitments that industries have made as well to uh, to reduce their their um, carbon intensity scores. Yeah, it's amazing the breadth of what AURI offers. I mean, you've now just touched on the, the, the deep research that you all do, you know, and it's on your staff. You do the convening of ecosystem partners at all levels, you know, top of the industry down to the little little startups. Uh, and then you help the entrepreneurs. And so I wanted to drill down a little bit on that piece. You talked about your entrepreneur in residence program, which which is new. Can you tell us also about how you you work with, with any entrepreneur that comes to you and says like, let's say I'm making a, a sugar-free, uh, fruit snack product. I would like to know the, you know, the amount of fiber in it and also how do I label it properly? How do you work with, with companies on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, great, great question. So yeah, as I think back, I mean, that, that, uh, that again is our, our, our bread and butter, right? In terms of what we do. And, mm -hmm. you know, we did a couple hundred projects last year, right? Overall as an organization of about 30 people. Um, and uh, right, it's just a, a lot, a lot of territory to cover, right? When we talk about food, right? Versus bioindustrial space and, Right, the convenings and, and initiatives and that right that that research. So our um uh, our system is is very focused on right talking right having a business development conversation with a with an entrepreneur around um, understanding their their problem or what they're they're facing a challenge around, uh, and then really thinking about how can we be be helpful. So uh, for food, for example, a great example uh, great example. We have a uh, one person that does right early scoping calls, uh, really understands our capacity and our, our technical abilities. Uh, and we'll sit down with that that individual to to really understand and and you know question if that what they need is what what they really need, uh, right? Based on our experience, and is that is that really the best path forward at this point, or should we be focusing on some some other areas, you know? And and he comes with twenty years of experience at, from General Mills and their their research department, right? So it just has a really good understanding of the commercialization aspects and and how right what's needed at at what given time. Uh, and then we have two food scientists then that 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 client or that business would get um, uh, put into in terms of very specific skills around shelf life stability to help them out uh, nutrition facts panels labeling regulatory requirements uh, right just all that those different input pieces and then right product optimization if we can do it uh, right or ingredient location uh, right if they're they're needing things as well so um, right that becomes a project uh, then for us uh, as an organization, and then we work with that that you know company for you know maybe anywhere from three months to six months to a year, because uh, usually this is their second job, uh, right? So it's not like they're they're full focus. It's they're coming to us as a small business uh, and helping them through that that journey. Uh, and I think what's unique about ARI as well and the the vision of the state legislature is we're able to do that at a very at a highly subsidized rate. Right for beginning food entrepreneurs to to move that that forward. Um, so if you're you're a new food entrepreneur, right, right we charge you 20% of our cost, right? So 80% of it is subsidized. Really want to give them the best opportunity that they can um, to get that product to the next, you know, whether that's a farmer's market, whether it's to retail, uh, right, whatever that that might look like. Uh, our our projects, I would say, on the bioindustrial side are a little bit more complex, uh, right? Just because there is a lot more complexity there in terms of what those might look like and Right, just the volumes and the the, the risk profile might be a, a little bit different, but we have, um, you know, uh, business development directors in both I'd say bio-based renewable and one in our byproduct streams uh, that will have those initial consultations and then look at how we connect them into our you know our laboratories there as well. Uh, so we'll we'll you know send samples into our analytical labs if it's for um, nutritional composition, right, or uh, even from a food uh, actually. Our food entrepreneurs are, are taking the, the bulk of our time in our analytical lab these days, right? Looking at, at composition and ingredients and uh, just those elements. Uh, but then uh, we do have uh, also a, a bio-industrial lab, I would call it, uh, right? Or more of a dirty lab where we're doing on a routine basis of pelleting, for example, of different products. Uh, that might be for feed, it might be for renewable energy, uh, right? And just looking at, at um, that scale and then how we can translate that to commercial scale. Right, from our, our pilot laboratory that we have. 
Um, what's also unique, we've, um, you know, we, we recently um, uh, purchased a, a hemp decorticator, and that's a few years ago now, uh, looking at the fiber markets there. Uh, we can do um, drying uh, technology as well. So looking at, right, a product that might come in and, right, really giving a good economic analysis of, of uh, different drying technologies and what, it, what, you know, what does that mean? Should, what should we invest in as a company uh, if we're looking at um, how to upcycle that, that co-product or byproduct through that process as well. So yeah, just a range of things, right, that we can help and do. Um, and I'd say a lot of what we do as well, it never turns into a project, right, but we um, will get them pointed in the right direction or get them connected to the right individuals. Uh, and I think that's just as valuable, uh, right, in terms of that initial consultation to um, conserve their their dollars, right, and pivot them to what they need to be doing. Um, so yeah, we're always open to those conversations. Uh, obviously, um, Minnesota gets special treatment with our relationship with the, the state legislature, but uh, we're, we are working with companies around the country now uh, that are coming to us and asking for assistance. So anybody that that is interested in, in those spaces, we'd love to have a visit and see if we can be helpful, because uh, at the end of the day, right, it's going to help all of agriculture and, and help uh, impact Minnesota as well. So Shannon, I have, I have a little bit a question, a little bit off script here. Um, I've toured the Cornell Pilot Facility in Geneva, where they can take a raspberry and turn it into raspberry jam and throw a label on there and give the entrepreneur a little bit of space. If there was someone, let's say, in the hemp fiber market that wanted to have access to your decoordinator, um, could they do the similar thing and 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 you know put an office there somewhere in proximity and then have access to this machine and then you guys will help them bring something to market? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So that's very much this uh, residency type program that we're we're thinking about, right? In terms of, you know, today a lot of the work that we do is our right scientists and maybe the company comes in and observes, uh, right? But right, how do we better utilize some of that that equipment by having right um, qualified people come in, right, and use that equipment and right get to those those next steps and then having our scientists there to help hand in hand, uh, right, on that and. Yeah, I think of of uh, hemp's a, a great example, right? I we've we're currently doing a, a project with uh, MinDOT or the Department of Transportation here in the Department of Agriculture on uh, hemp erosion control blankets, uh, right? So think about road construction and right the blankets that get put up for um, for sediment and um, right control runoff, right? And how can we switch that to, from plastic to to hemp, uh, right? And so we did the early processing in our facility, right, and then transfer that to a. Uh, a commercial facility to do the final right the the final production all right so how we, you think of us as a continuum right and those um in those journeys and we can help connect right to those next um locations as well because we have awareness of who they are uh, and think of it as a, a co-manufacturing type uh, opportunity uh, exactly good well i'm picking up several really good pieces of gold here and i have multiple follow-ups with it i'll do privately because you've already tickled my interest in several things here um, when I came out a couple of years back um, to one of your events, maybe it was an involved event, maybe it was a different one, you had a reverse pitch, and it may have been the first or second time you did that. And I was very skeptical, and I mentioned to other people, and they were very skeptical. Skeptical because usually what happens is these are gratuitous. A company will come out with some sort of softball thing, more for exposure. And I think everyone who witnessed that was stunned at how real the company's issues were they were offering. And, and not only just offering to either buy or JV. I mean, it was, it was, it was open doors. And it, I, I'm, I'm still astounded that you were able to get that level of buy-in and trust from your key strategics. And not only that, the next year is even better. So can you talk a little, I mean, for, I mean, Paul Eulich is on the phone here and, and I know the rest of folks who are probably watching this later would love to hear some tips and best practices. How do you engage strategics to, to really trust you enough to allow you to put this out there in public? Yeah, great question. It was so much fun, right? On that, I still think back to that first event that we did in, in 2019, I believe it was, uh, right? Overall, and we had, I think, over 400 people in the room. Uh, and I don't think our ecosystem had ever seen or been part, right, of a, of a reverse pitch, right? In, in terms of um, how do we connect? And I think it's always a question that, right, as we, as I think about my, my entrepreneurial hat and the conversations, it's, right, how do we connect with, um, with the large companies? Right, is often a, a question that that we get and have, and right, how do you get in the door? Um, so, so right, and we hear we see a lot of pitches from entrepreneurs, right, that have their idea and are right looking for for funding and right, taking hope, hoping there right, that a corporate will hear it and um, and uh, and move it along. Um, and so we we were really trying to think creatively around you know what could we do. So so um, Embold, the Embold wasn't officially Embold at that time, but we were you know in formation and working on on um, different different areas. Uh, and one was soil and soil and water, right? We had one on packaging, 
um, as well. And, and uh, AUI is a, a member of, of Embold uh, and uh, uh, right, helping drive those collaborative spaces of, which is a CEO led initiative uh, of the egg and food companies here to really, right, where can we come together and, and be more impactful as a group uh, versus as, as individual companies. Um, so um, um, I think of, right, those, those different areas that we were looking at. And one, one was entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, and uh, you've mentioned Food Egg Ideas Week already. Um, entrepreneurship was, right, that was really Food Egg Ideas Week was, was the entrepreneurship piece and that what can we do to, right, unite the ecosystem. Grow North was relatively new at that time, uh, doing a great job of, of getting people together and sharing information. Uh, and we were really uh, trying to think, what can we do around innovation, right? And innovation is broad, uh, right, as you think about it in terms of what that, that could be. Um, so uh, a lot of, um, you know, sit down meetings and work closely with McKinsey and company who's part of Embold as well to, to just ideate around, you know, what, what can we do that's unique here uh, versus maybe where, where other, you know, other locations. Uh, so we, um, um, you know, had a lot of conversations. We went through a lot of different ideas. I ended up looking at, you know, what's going on and uh, really taking a page from IT and biotech, right, that was already doing this type of, uh, of an approach. Uh, and uh, then started having conversations with uh, the strategics or the corporates, right, in terms of, you know, how does this fit, uh, what could we do, um, right, some of them were already doing, um, right, this, like, from a, from an internet standpoint, or, right, I think General Mills, for example, had, uh, had a program where they were doing this, you know, most of the teams or companies have external innovation groups, right, that are out looking for, for technology, um, so I uh, was really just thinking about, okay, where is this really a, a fit and, and what can we do right to, to get these ideas out into the open? So I'd say it wasn't easy, Andrew, uh, right? In terms of uh, making that, you've, you've talked about, right? Uh, how do you really make it impactful and get to the, the objective that you want to? Uh, and uh, I did get a couple of companies to, to commit right away, uh, just kind of like the idea and we're really committed to this, this collaborative um, aspect of, of um, you know, Embold and, and raising the opportunity. And you know, once you get two or three, um, right, it gets a lot easier, uh, right? In terms of others doing well, if they're going to take a risk, right, or do this, and then we can do it, do it as well. Um, so that was great fun. And then just thinking about how do we, you know, it took a lot of effort, right, to uh, think about the different ideas that they had, uh, and what was, you know, meaningful, and not, as you said, just something so broad that it that it wasn't, um, you know, a solution would be hard to to put together. Uh, and worked very closely with each of those those companies, and to help, um, you know, articulate that. Uh, get to a place where everybody was was comfortable and then right work through all the confidentiality issues that we had to as well uh, to put that together but it was was great fun i know there's a lot of relationships that have been formed um some ideas that have moved forward uh, some i think short term some that were are you know longer term uh and um right we've been able to, to continue it on we right had to switch virtual obviously in 2020 and 2021 uh, we took a break in 2022 uh, just with timing uh, and uh, hoping to have it back in person here in 2023 uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's super fun. I've seen other groups from now doing it as well. I think like Rethink um, has, I, I just see it much more regularly in food and agriculture now than I did back when we first started. Yeah, I remember that first event in 2019. I think the governor came and opened the day. And um, I do feel like you were part of a movement of, of sort of open innovation. And to your point, some companies were doing it, but not nearly as many as are today. Um, and I think it's it's a real game changer that major corporations like PepsiCo, like General Mills, are now quite transparent about how they identify and source innovation because it opens the door for these startups with brilliant ideas to find their way in, whereas before it was very much a black box. So, so kudos to you guys for seeing, seeing that coming and taking the reins and running with it. Um, can, is it possible for you to, to kind of hone in on some of the hot problems that that you discovered as a result of some of these past reverse pitches? Yeah, so I definitely can. And I, I'm like, I'm probably thinking forward in terms of what I'm hearing more than, than thinking. Sure, back that's on, good on, too. On, on <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I think sustainable protein is is just a, um, such a, a key area right now. Um, right, I think uh, I heard um, a speaker say, right, we do carbohydrates really well. Um, right, protein's much more challenging, right? And I just think it's going to take a lot more innovative approaches in terms of what does that mean? And I know you're already talking about, right, insect protein, obviously plant proteins. Um, we look at fermentation uh, as an opportunity and, and um, right, and then we've got the whole cultured um, side of this as, as well. So I, I think that is a space that is uh, still, you know, wide open for, for innovation. I think there's already, you know, a lot of things that are set in motion and, and pathways. Uh, but but ways that we could be helping scale right some of these these uh, innovative ideas that are, are out there. 
Uh, I think, right, as I think about, about challenges, this whole carbon intensity piece is, is hard, um, right, in terms of what is that going to look like? And I think there's a lot of commitments that, that have been made, um, and there's not a lot of solutions yet to get, right, there's some, there's things that will get us moving forward, but right, that last 20% is going to be hard, uh, right, as, as is, is typical. So I think innovation around creatively thinking around these, these value chains and what it means, and, you know, that, that can be anything from how do we get you know, incentivize farmers to do regenerative agriculture, right, which we see a lot of programs and a lot of the awards around Climate Smart Aid that just came out, uh, right, and I think of like game game theory, right, in terms of some of the, the challenges that we've, like, how do you do, yeah, gamification, uh, right, and uh, in terms of driving interest uh, on this and, right, making sure that the producer has, has right, has a, a benefit from this, which is, is really important to us, as well as, right, that value all the way through the, the, the value chain there as well. Uh, I think local and regional meat processing is in, in need, right, of additional innovation as well and thinking about that business model, um, right, we've, we're have we doing a lot of work, we've hired two meat scientists in the last year, uh, right, really trying to think about what can we do in the upper Midwest to, to make sure those are viable businesses um, going forward from a business, um, technical assistance, new products, new processes, just, you know, the whole rendering piece and the economies of scale challenges and um, there's, you know, we, we think of, of, right, there must be some different ways that we can, we can think about that. Um, I think the other area that's really intriguing for us right now from a, an innovation is, is community digesters, uh, right, and this whole renewable natural gas space uh, of, um, right, there's incentives, there's the low carbon fuel standards, um, right, we, we know that there is food processing waste, there's small dairies that can't participate today from an economic standpoint. Right. What are what are ways that we can re-envision? And right, Europe is is doing it already through community digesters, um, but we haven't really cracked that that nut here in the U.S. yet. Um, and um, you know, how do we again think creatively around that? And how do we de-risk some of that early interest? Uh, right, of looking at that model, uh, I think is another area that we're we're really you know spending some time and drilling down on um, in terms of right what feedstocks. Um, I, I should mention we now have a uh, right a semi trailer anaerobic digester on site at one of our facilities, so we can do some pretty good scale up in terms of what the gas potential is, and then uh, getting some digestate to look at its values and nutrients as well. So an area that we're we've invested in here in the last uh, year or two uh, of um, right just looking at that space um, differently than we had in the past as well. So as I think about a North Star, we'll likely be spending more time um, there too with uh, some recent investments. So. You get all the cool toys over there. I tell you, I'm yeah, starting I know. to get a little, little twitchy here. I can't wait to get out there uh, in a week or so and, and maybe maybe kick the tires on a few of these things. Well, if, if you're looking for a longer term uh, interest, we'd love to have you spend some time in the anaerobic digestion render. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have lots of questions about that. Um, Shanna, you've laid a whole lot out here. Um, what what are your milestones for 2023? I mean, what are some of those tangible things you're looking for? And, when we spoke to other people, it surprised me. Some people just want employees. They just want qualified employees to come and work for them. Some folks want board members or advisors. Others obviously want money or capital. What are some of those things for 2023 that you really are focused on? Yeah, for, for 2023, I mean, if we're just looking at a year out, one is making sure that we're we're driving as much impact as we can, uh, right, as an, an organization. So um, it's really um, uh, working through those those um, projects and products and right process improvements that we that we continue to uh, do so. And I, I think um, you know just from a, a you make a really good point on labor needs, uh, right? Is is definitely a, a challenge. We've been pretty fortunate at ARI, but uh, it's that that um, it's easy to take on more right more than than what you have, and that alignment and, and right sizing uh, what we're doing is is definitely a critical element that we are are really focused on uh, in terms of just staff well-being right and making sure that we're we're you know making those those correct choices uh, as an organization around our own impact and what we can and can't do and, and right looking at our collaborators right for for involvement and uh, and handoffs there as well um, I think we just uh, were awarded a um, uh, uh, agricultural innovation center demonstration program grant from the USDA uh, which is going to uh, uh, drive some new opportunities for us in terms of some service-based approaches to producers. Uh, and that's a, a pretty exciting opportunity for us. We've been, been looking at that for a, for a couple of years. Uh, and we just hear from right, our, our small producers in terms of the, the needs that they have around, um, you know, how do we better connect your distribution to right into those next steps and, and help scale their, their growth. So I think one area that, that I see us um, from, a, from a 2023 standpoint is doing 
uh, something much more dedicated on market um, analysis, market analysis, market intelligence for for some of those producer businesses and for our other businesses as well. We haven't had that that resource on staff, um, and I think that is uh, in turning into a, an increasing need uh, for us because we see a lot of things from a technical standpoint and technology readiness, um, but a lot of the conversations lack that market readiness conversation, right? Or as I think about um, right what. You've got a solution, but is it really answering a problem, um, right? That we see, and, and is the market really, really needing it? Uh, and uh, we'll likely be spending much more, more time there in terms of uh, um, augmenting some of the services that we do. Um, so that's that's one area. And then I, I, I think we'll continue on some of these new crops um, opportunities. Uh, we added a novel supply chains director uh, last year, uh, right? Looking at um, these cash relay crops that the U of M is working on, and, and others on um, um, just looking at these. You know, camelina, pennycress, uh, perennial crops like currants. Uh, we're doing quite a bit on alfalfa, all right. In terms of this, how do we maybe re envision some of these other crops, um, right, and start to, to move them forward from an industry pull approach? So I, I, I will put in a plug. We have um, uh, October fifth. We're doing a, a fields of innovation event uh, as part of Food Egg Ideas Week. Uh, we'll be focusing on um, Minnesota's smaller crops uh, during that seminar. So talking about what are the opportunities for oats for potatoes, right, for, um, we'll have uh, somebody talk about rye, I believe as well, Kernza, uh, and uh, right, all those, those, and we even have a carrot, pro carrot producer and processor now in the state of Minnesota, right, which is uh, pretty interesting operating out by Morris that's supplying, right, local, um, uh, local grocery stores, right, so, uh, right, how do we highlight just some of these different opportunities, I met a spearmint producer up in North Dakota, right, a while back, right, there's just some unique um, approaches and Right. How do we just create more awareness around those different opportunities if producers are looking for, um, you know, diversifying their, their crop mix and, and looking at rotations as well. So that'll be on October 5th. And um, I think it'll be a great, great session and some great speakers uh, for, for that one. Super cool. So you've, you've again provided a nice segue into uh, one of the questions I wanted to sort of start to end with, I guess, we're running out of time, but you've alluded to what would be nice to have. Can you tell us more about, you know, what, what you, what is your wish list and maybe also kind of how the audience can help if it's yes. staff, if it's dollars, if it's more ideas. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Great, great question. So I always have a great wish list, uh, right. In terms <laughs> of, uh, uh, more time is always one of them, right. That we all face, but no, um, from a, a wish list. So one of the things that, that we're really looking at is, is expanding our, our facilities, uh, we are, are up against our footprints uh, in um, in Wasika uh, specifically, right? I'm um, looking at doubling that that capacity in the next year, um, and uh, that would be a, a major a major win for us from a, an efficiency standpoint. I think allowing more more back to the comment that was made earlier of how can companies come in and right embed themselves, um, right? The the space challenges right now are are make that a little bit more challenging, but right opening that up would would I think be uh, just a great transition, right, from from the the pilot work into right some small commercial batches uh, that would be uh, would be wonderful, right? Because a lot of those spaces don't exist today uh, to do some test marketing and and how can we add that that capability? Um, the other the other area is um, we're part of the egg innovation campus um, effort up in Crookston, Minnesota, uh, right? And that is a, a really unique footprint as well in terms of a, a nonprofit crush facility, uh, right? That will be a, a mechanical crush, uh, three different lines. Uh, to look at, at, I mean, crushing quantity um, um, crops as well, but then have being set up to do uh, test markets, right, for whether it be camelina, penny press, unique traits for soybeans, right, where you could uh, reserve one of those lines, right, to do uh, a scale up to do market testing again. Uh, and, and phase two of that will be very much focused on, right, innovation and, and research. Uh, and we're working right now on, on what that would be and, and thinking right around right, that footprint. And I think plant proteins, uh, protein concentrates, isolates, uh, right? A, a pilot facility or scaling that up is is definitely in the cards of something we're looking at. So anybody that is thinking about that or has interest um, would like to collaborate or partner or just talk through that. That would be be fantastic. Uh, and then finally, um, we are a five hundred one c three, so donations are always uh, encouraged. Uh, as well, if you've got a um, a sweet spot for value added agriculture and just uh, right looking forward, we call it seeing around corners. Uh, as an organization around, right, just what are those next things that we need to start de-risk that can really be impactful, um, not just for agriculture, right, but for, for the, the community and for, uh, right, everyone as well. I think we know we face a lot of challenges in feeding the world in a sustainable manner. Uh, we've got uh, renewable energy needs as well, 
uh, right? How, how can we you know, come together from a resource perspective to help support some of those initiatives, activities uh, that we really, really wanna drive forward. Uh, and then um, attend our events, I'd say would be the, the other uh, way, uh, sign up for our newsletter, uh, right? And then just um, please make referrals, right? We love having conversations with, um, with anybody around the, uh, around the, the country, uh, around the world, uh, right? In terms of, uh, is, there, is there something there that we could partner or collaborate around? Uh, and we do have one initiative program where we do collaboration where we cost share, right? To create some educational initiatives. So uh, lots of ways to engage with us um, overall, but uh, right, we, wanna, we want great, great partners and uh, ways that we can, can work together, right? To, to move these, these agricultural opportunities forward. True to nature, Shannon. Um, you have used the pronoun we in pretty much every sentence that you said there, and it's rarely <laughs> about Shannon. So I do have a Shannon question here, um, and, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what book are you reading right now, or what book have you read recently that was impactful that you'd like to share with us and, and suggest that perhaps we pick up? Yeah, great, great question overall. And I wish I had more time to read, right? And I'll end, I'll end see, uh, Andrew, it's, it's always, uh, uh, I end up doing a lot of time on, on work and just um, keeping, keeping up on what's, um, you know, what's, what's happening. So one of the books that, that has been on my, I'm not all the way through it yet, is Traction, right? And looking at entrepreneurial operating systems and as we think about our strategy and implementation, uh, right? So it's a little work related, but also kind of a, an enjoyment area for me in terms of, uh, right, how do we, we think about our, you know, our direction and then implementation and across through the, um, the, through, through the organization. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I won't say, say we, we again, but right, it, it really is, um, right, how does that, how do you do that in a, in a change manner that, that really is, um, you know, drives, drives the process forward, uh, right, and gets us to the, the point that we want to be uh, as an organization. Well, good. I appreciate that. And I did drop a link in the chat box to Ori. It's A-U-R-I dot org. So um, if you appreciate watching this uh, video, um, stroke a small check or a big check and send it Shannon's way. Shannon, thank you. <laughs> this is this is phenomenal. I, you know, I almost wish I was down there as a startup entrepreneur so I could go through that system. I mean, it's it's everything is there. It really, I mean, you are designed for the purpose that you're, you're put there for. And um, you were a fantastic steward of, of this organization. And can't wait to see you in about a week out there in Minnesota when, when I head out there. So uh, fantastic. Yeah. No, well, thank, thank you for, for having me. And thank you to both you, Andrew, and Christina for everything that you do, all right, to drive innovation and right the ecosystem opportunities and make those, those connections and right, share the good word of what's happening in, in agriculture and right innovation in, in the entrepreneurial community. It's um, right, it's as I think I started with, it's just so um, just, just um, enjoyable. Right to to see the the great ideas and right the the parts that each of us can have uh, in terms of uh, turning those into reality is uh, yeah. um, a great place to be. It's a it's a bit of pleasure to work with you always, Shannon. And you know maybe we can find a way to collaborate on some sort of like musical rendition of what AURI means to Minnesota because of your musical background. And you know, yeah. there's it, always time for a fun project, right? Right, right. But as Andrew said, it's always a we, right? So you have to bring an <laughs> instrument or or something as well. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, we'll have to have a conversation because I was also a music major when I started college. So who knew? Wow, well. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of fun. Well, thanks so much again for being with us today, Shannon and Andrew, for coordinating this. It's been a lot of fun. Exactly. Thank you very much. Have a great sure. weekend. You too. Take care. <laughs>